Hello, my name is Sarah Hilden, and I'm a marketing engineer in the CDS group at Train. Today we'll be going over how to model waterside economizers in Trace 700. We'll go through an example and I will address some of the common questions we get in the CDS Support Center when users are working on these types of models. In this presentation, I'll show you how to configure plant equipment with a waterside economizer, as well as how to modify library members if you want to have a custom chiller economizer configuration for later reuse. Then, we'll see where to look to determine how much energy is saved by the water economizer. It's worth noting that ASHRAE Standard 90.1 2013 requires waterside economizers for systems with hydronic cooling and humidification systems designed to maintain a dew point greater than 35, when an economizer is already required per 6.5.1. ASHRAE defines a water economizer as a system by which the supply air of a cooling system is cooled indirectly with water that is itself cooled by heat or mass transfer to the environment without the use of mechanical cooling. In short, it's a system that lets you run your compressor less, or even not at all, during periods where conditions are favorable. Typically, other equipment must still run and may even need to work harder, so it's important to consider the system as a whole, not just the chiller's consumption. The methods we'll consider today are applicable only to water-cooled chillers. Why would I use a waterside economizer when I can just put an economizer on my air handlers, you might ask? A few reasons include the following. Tight humidity requirements may negate the efficiency gains of an airside economizer. If the air is cool but humid, it may cost more to dehumidify than is gained by the reduction in cooling. Or if the air is dry, humidification loads might increase. Not all hair handling units can be equipped with economizers due to space constraints, distance to the outdoor air intake, increased return or exhaust fan sizing, duct sizing or routing, or other application specific constraints. Dedicated outdoor air units are typically sized to handle only the ventilation loads, so full cooling capacity cannot be achieved by an airside economizer. Now that we've highlighted situations where we can't use an air economizer, Let's talk about some different types of waterside economizers and how to model them in Trace 700. Three types of water economizers are considered within this presentation. Strainer cycle, plate and frame heat exchangers, and refrigerant migration. In the strainer cycle, tower water is valved directly into the chilled water loop when the outdoor air wet bulb is low enough. It's the most efficient water economizer option, but is not widely accepted due to fouling concerns. Typically, the tower water passes through a filter or strainer before entering the chilled water loop, hence the name. The strainer cycle cannot run simultaneously with the chiller, so if the tower cannot meet the entire cooling load, the strainer cycle does not operate. This is not used much, but sometimes an existing system must be modeled for comparison purposes. Next up, the plate and frame heat exchanger. Now the water loops are isolated, keeping the chilled water loop clean with a slight decrease in heat transfer efficiency due to the heat exchanger itself. The heat exchanger typically requires annual maintenance, adding the expense of cleaning and reassembly, so it's important to include this recurring cost in the life cycle cost analysis of this option. This slide shows a simplified depiction of a series connected heat exchanger. When the heat exchanger is configured in series with the chiller, Trace first tries to have the heat exchanger meet the entire load. If it can't, the chiller handles the remaining load, also known as integrated operation. When piped in parallel, Trace 700 assumes non-simultaneous operation. Condenser water is routed to either the chiller or the heat exchanger. There is no mixing. An advantage of a parallel configuration is that the chiller can be isolated for seasonal cleaning and maintenance. A few important things to note about modeling heat exchangers in Trace 700. Trace assumes the capacity of the heat exchanger equals that of the chiller to which it is assigned. Heat exchanger approach is modified in the equipment library and then placed in the project via the chiller on which it was configured. The default is 3 Fahrenheit, by the way. And lastly, the free cooling pump runs when some or all of the load is satisfied using free cooling. Finally, there is refrigerant migration. When returning tower water is colder than the chilled water temperature, Refrigerant pressure in the condenser is lower than that of the evaporator, driving the boiled off vapor into the condenser. Once the refrigerant condenses, it flows back into the evaporator by gravity, so compressor operation is not necessary. When modeling refrigerant migration in Trace 700, keep in mind that the free cooling available in the model is limited to 40% of equipment capacity 
and that if the cooling load for that hour cannot be met by refrigerant migration, the load is satisfied using the conventional cooling cycle. The free cooling capacity is a function of the entering condenser water temperature, leaving the tower, and the refrigerant migration free cooling model in trace 700. In advance of this video, I created a building model using the new file wizard. If you're interested in learning how to use the new file wizard, please watch our other YouTube video that explains how to create a quick block building for analysis. For this example, we'll consider a 25,000 square foot, five zone building in Boise, Idaho, which is in climate zone 6B. I created the base model with no free cooling in advance. Let's go into the program now and I'll show you how to get started on setting up the Waterside Economizer alternatives. I'm going to show you a couple ways to set up a Waterside Economizer in Trace 700. You can include free cooling in a custom equipment library member for ease and reuse, or just add it directly to your project alternative, if the default heat exchanger works for you. To configure custom equipment, click on the Library Template Editor and select Libraries, Equipment, Cooling. Remember, you can only modify custom equipment, so in this case, I'll copy the default water-cooled chiller and rename it Economizer Demo. Next, click the Options tab where free cooling type, pump, and full load energy rate can be specified. Once the free cooling type has been changed from None, the Plate and Frame Heat Exchanger Approach field is no longer read-only. Again, the default value for the heat exchanger approach in Trace 700 is 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Strain or cycle, of course, does not use the Plate and Frame Heat Exchanger Approach field. For either parallel or series heat exchangers, you select the pump and its full load energy rate here. No pump is required for strainer or refrigerant migration. I'll create a parallel configured plate and frame heat exchanger with the high efficiency constant volume condenser pump at 30 feet. Then back at the main tab, I'll save this new chiller with its free cooling already built right in. I'll use it in the example to come. Back in the project navigator screen, I'll copy the first alternative that we created with no free cooling. In order to determine savings, there must be a plain Jane alternative to compare to, as there is no specific report that reflects the savings from a waterside economizer. To modify the plant, you'll need to right-click in Alternative 2, then select Plants, Create Plants Based on Alternative 1, allowing modification of the plant input data. Then in Create Plants, on the Cooling Equipment tab, I'll go ahead and click on the Controls button. From here, I can apply Strainer Cycle using the second method I described earlier to this plant. I hit OK, Apply, and it's done. It's not a bad idea to rename this alternative as well. For this third alternative, I'll simply copy the first alternative again. This time, I want to use my Economizer Demo Chiller for the cooling equipment. So, I'll create plants based on alternative 2. Now, since I had created that chiller, I might as well use it as my cooling equipment, and as you can see, the free cooling is already built right in. For the final alternative in the model, again, I copy the first alternative. This time I'll create plants based on alternative 3. Then, in the cooling equipment tab, I click on controls to simply change the free cooling from parallel to series. The pump tags along for the ride and we're done. Finally, a utility rate must be added to the project in order to run the economics calculations, if you choose to do so. This, along with any incremental equipment and maintenance costs, are entered in the Define Economics section of the program. I'm using $50 a ton for the heat exchangers at 175 tons, for $8,750, along with an annual maintenance fee of $300 for all three methods of the free cooling, as a generic example. I've selected the Northern Power Utility Rate. Be sure to get accurate costs for each of these items, as well as the proper utility rate structure for the area where the building is located. We're ready to calculate. Setting up the free cooling is easy, but remember, there must be a base alternative created in order to determine savings due to free cooling. The default heat exchanger approach can be modified in the equipment library and defaults to 3 Fahrenheit. When a heat exchanger is configured in parallel, it operates only when it can meet the entire cooling load in any given hour. And finally, if a life cycle cost analysis is to be performed, 
The proper costs and utility rates must be entered for the project alternatives. A few things that must be kept in mind. The tower must reject the heat of compression in addition to the design cooling load. This is what it will be sized for. When the plant operates in free cooling mode, the building is not typically going to be a design load and ambient conditions are cooler. Also, tower approach increases as outdoor air wet bulb decreases and tower performance is based also on the cooling load. As a result, the tower may need to work harder to get free cooling. Now, let's look at how to understand what we'll get out of Trace 700. It's important to look at all the associated equipment, not just the chiller, to determine the net energy savings as the tower operation will vary and additional pumps are required for certain configurations of waterside economizing. Depending on the efficiency of each component within the system, it's up to you to use this information to determine whether it makes sense to implement the waterside economizer when the model is used for design. The load profile and ambient conditions play a role in how much benefit is gained from free cooling. In the next screencast, we'll see where to look for the energy consumption information, we'll discuss a caveat to the cooling tower operation report, and see where to find out if there's really a payback. Looking at the energy cost budget summary is a quick way to compare the net building consumption for each alternative in the model. Notice here that the consumption for cooling equipment, pumps, and heat rejection are all separate line items. The sum of these three line items is what must be compared to determine the savings resulting from adding free cooling to your design. While the total building savings in this example is around 3.5 to 4% for the heat exchangers, we can see the chiller electric use is reduced significantly for each of the free cooling methods. Note that the heat rejection for the series configured unit is 119% of the no economizer version in alternative 1. The nice thing about the ECB report is that all the numbers are in one spot for each of the alternatives. Obviously, alternative 2, the strainer cycle, had the greatest energy savings with the heat exchanger configurations right behind. If you wanted to know when the free cooling is benefiting the chiller, you should be checking the Equipment Energy Consumption Report. In this case, I can quickly go between the alternatives using the tree on the left-hand side of the screen to quickly compare the annual chiller consumption of each alternative since it's in the same location on the page. Take note of the annual consumption values for the chiller and the tower over here as I switch between the alternatives. Notice that for no free cooling, the chiller consumption is about 380,000 kilowatt hours. The tower used around 92,000 kilowatt hours. There's cooling in the winter season as well. Look at January, 26,000 kilowatt hours. Remember that. When I move to the strainer cycle, it's easy to see the chiller consumption was reduced almost in half to 200,000 kilowatt hours, but the tower increased by almost 20%. And look, no chiller consumption in the winter. Alternative 3, with the parallel heat exchanger, used more cooling than the strainer and less heat rejection than the strainer. But take a look at the new free cooling pump that was added, shown here at almost 14,000 kilowatt hours. We see also there are some months in the winter where the cooling load wasn't met by the free cooling, so the chiller had to run for some of the hours in that month. Finally, the series configuration saved a bit more on the chiller at around 212,000 kWh, but the tower consumed the most energy of each of the four alternatives. Note that the chiller consumed less in the cool season than it did in the parallel configuration. Now let's take a moment to look at the economic summary report. Looking at lines 2 and 3 here in the comparison, we can see that the heat exchangers both pay back in this example. At the bottom of the report, the annual savings versus no economizer are shown for each alternative, along with the plant's kWh per ton hour. This value applies only to the cooling plant electric consumption. I want to point out that the cooling tower analysis report shows only tower hours coincident with chiller operation. Clearly, the tower is running more in free cooling modes. It's just not reflected in this report. But since the tower is off more hours in the free cooling alternatives on this report, it can be inferred that the chiller itself is running fewer hours as well.
I used the trace visualizer to look at one day in November from the simulation we just ran. You can see in hour 10 that both the series and parallel connected heat exchangers are able to handle the entire cooling load. However, in hour 13, the series free cooling operates in integrated mode, and in this case, among others, the series configured heat exchanger plant actually consumes more energy overall. This is why the series option doesn't always provide the expected savings. In hours where the free cooling pump runs where the chiller also runs, we can see the integrated operation of the series connected heat exchanger. While it's apparent that the total chiller energy consumed during these hours is indeed less than parallel, the combination of the harder working tower with the free cooling pump offsets the energy saved by turning off the chiller. So, what have we learned? The chiller's operation alone doesn't necessarily provide the net savings over the course of the year. Be sure to consider the tower and ancillary pumps to get the whole picture. Typical building profiles where waterside economizing makes sense include hospitals and large office buildings in climate zones 4 and colder. Generally, the coincident cooling loads with moderate outdoor air conditions enable benefits to be gained from waterside free cooling. And our most commonly asked question about trace free cooling modeling, why doesn't trace show more savings from series than parallel? Series free cooling has the chiller picking up any remaining load that the free cooling cycle can't meet. Yet the tower and free cooling pumps continue to run as hard as they can for the free cooling cycle to continue. But because the free cooling cycle is stealing so much of the cooling load, the chiller is typically at an inefficient operating condition. We can see this effect a few hours of the year as we saw in the visualizer graph in the previous slide. The free cooling pump and the tower energy go up and may even exceed the overall plant energy consumption of the parallel free cooling option that turns the free cooling off once the cycle can't meet the entire load. This completes today's demonstration on modeling waterside economizers. Hopefully we've given you a basic understanding on how to enter them in Trace 700 and how to evaluate whether their use in your model will yield appropriate savings. If you need some assistance in other areas of the program or just want a better understanding of some of the concepts we talked about today, here are some additional resources available to you. As always, please feel free to contact the CDS Support Center by phone or email with any comments, questions, or modeling issues you may be experiencing. Thank you for your time, and happy energy modeling!